I'd like to introduce your presenter, Ms. Rebecca Smith. She is director and member of GBQ Consulting, focusing on areas of litigation consulting, forensic accounting, economic damages, and business valuations. She has experience rendering services in litigation matters and has qualified to testify in court as an expert witness on business valuations, accounting, and financial matters, economic damages, asset tracing, as well as many other matters. She has also served as a court appointed expert. And here is Rebecca Smith. Right. Okay, you unmuted me after all the noise I was making. <laughs> uh, all right, well, welcome everybody. I'm sure you were listening to my bio and thinking, what does this person know about PPP? Um, so because my practice is so heavily tied to litigation, uh, when the courts in Ohio shut down, it was right about the time that uh, the uh, CARES Act came out. And uh, a lot of the attorneys I worked with just sort of put their cases on hold, thinking this would be a one or two week uh, issue with the courts being shut down. So being the good team player that I am, I said, sure, I'll take this PPP section of the CARES Act and be happy to figure it out and dissect it. And here we are, what, five months later, and I still am talking about PPP. Um, because for any of you that have been following this, to say that this has been like trying to hit a moving target is a complete understatement. Um, even just, it, I had these materials prepared and on Monday they dropped 23 new FAQs on us um, from the treasury. And I think uh, for anybody who's been really following this closely or <laughs> following it even loosely, the, the problem is, is there are just so many questions that still don't have answers that we have come a long way. They've, they have clarified a lot. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that's still subject to interpretation. So, but it's sort of, this is a little bit of a hodgepodge. This is an update. Um, I did a, a pretty involved webinar a couple months ago. And so this is kind of like what's, kind of, what's been new in the last 30 to 60 days. So we're going to talk about the Flexibility Act. We're going to talk about the new forms that came out. Um, interestingly enough, I mean, this is kind of how we have found out some of the information, right? Instead of them actually saying, okay, we're going to issue these forms and here's additional information for you. They just kind of sneak it into the instructions of the new form. And if you don't go through the forms and read them very carefully, or uh, we kind of figured out some of it by like working the math through the forms, it, they, just, they just aren't overtly um, disclosing it. The joke in our office is like, how is there not one single CPA on this, um, you know, on this advisory committee? And the other joke is that if there is a CPA and we ever meet them in a dark alley, we're going to beat them up. So Okay, I will assume you are all laughing at your desks. So we'll talk about the Flexibility Act, the new forms, these new FAQs that just came out on Monday, the pending legislation, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, a little preview of the Main Street Lending Program. Um, that was really interesting because I think there's actually a very big role for accountants in that program, specifically forensic accountants. All right, so the PPP Flexibility Act of 2020. So there's, uh, this is the act that came out that basically extended the time period from eight weeks to 24 weeks. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. This was a, a result of a lot of lobbying by like the restaurant industry and the hospitality industry. So uh, when it came out, basically what they did in the, from a legislative standpoint is they replaced everything in the CARES Act that said eight weeks with 24 weeks. And they replaced everything that said June 30th with December 30, 31st, 2020. So it made it sort of look like you had a bilateral choice. It was either eight or 24 weeks. Um, and it said that if you had a loan already, you could opt in for the eight week period. Um, but anybody who got a loan after, I think it was August, no, July 8th or something like that, you would automatically be in the 24 week period. So I think the concern a lot of people had was, well, does that mean I have to maintain my FTEs for 24 weeks? And what does that look like? What if I run out of money in week 10, which obviously you're going to because you're only giving two and a half months worth of money. So what they did come out and say is basically, you can stop any time in between the eight weeks and the 24 weeks. Um, so, you know, true to its name, the Flexibility Act did give people a lot of flexibility in the period that they wanted to use. Um, so, you know, what that does is that allows a lot of people to sort of take this subjectivity out of some of these categories, right? So instead of going for, you know, 
eight weeks and having to try and pull in every dollar of rent and leases and loan interest to try and get to your total amount. Now you can just go 10 or 12 weeks and you can just use all payroll. Um, now, of course, if you go 10 or 12 weeks, there's that balance with, did you keep your head count up um, for the FTE reduction factor? Um, but a lot of our clients are just saying, well, fine, I'm just going to go 12 weeks or 11 weeks. I'm going to just use payroll then. That way I don't even have to do anything except simply submit my payroll reports, which the S... Oh, no. Sorry, guys. This is the... Um, this is what happens when you stack your laptop on a bunch of books so that you can have a really cool background. So, uh, <laughs> secrets out. All right. Um, so, and this is also the, the downside of being a hand talker. I smack my laptop. So we have a lot of clients who are just saying, I'm just gonna go 10 or 11 weeks, submit the payroll reports because what the SBA has told banks is that if it's payroll reports from a reputable payroll provider, then, you don't have to really scrutinize those. So it makes the forgiveness process easier. Um, so along with that, we all know there's this $100,000 cap on wages. So the Flexibility Act up that. So now you can go up to $46,000 and change for someone who makes $100,000. But if you only go 10 weeks for your time period, it has to be pro rata. So that's only if you go all 24 weeks for the $100,000 employee. You can't go 10 weeks and then claim $46,000 of wages for someone. So you have to do that math. But if you went the full 24, you can get $46,000 of someone's salaries. Um, there are some additional limitations that came out in the August FAQs that really have to do with owners. And I'm gonna talk about that when we get to the owners section. So that $100,000 is for non-employee owners. If you're a 2% or more owner, there are different restrictions that apply to you. Uh, the big change also, this is also part of the lobbying, particularly again by the restaurant associations, uh, because they wanted some of their fixed costs, like their rent covered, is the 75-25 rule, which was that um, at least 75% of your forgivable dollars had to be payroll is now at least 60% of your forgivable dollars has to be payroll. Now you'll note that I wrote, must spend at least 60% of loan amount in payroll. That is how it read, um, and it caused a lot of panic and incitement because people thought that then it was basically a cliff, meaning like if you were $1 short of paying, spending 60%, so you have a $100,000 loan and you only spend $59,999 on payroll, the interpretation at first, sort of the literal interpretation was you get zero forgiveness. They since came out on June 8th and clarified that it's not a cliff, that the 60-40 only applies to your forgivable portion. So let's say you have a $100,000 loan and you spend 60,000 of it, at least 60% of that 60,000 has to be payroll. So again, under the category of giving people more flexibility, if you're a business where you haven't been able to get your payroll back up, but you still have some heavy fixed costs like rent, so say you're a restaurant, then this really helps you out because it allows you to pay more of your rent even while your head counts down. The FTE calculation, so this is the part of the calculation where it says, um, you know, how much money did you spend and were you able to hold on to all of your people, right? That's the fundamental philosophy of the CARES Act and the PPP program. We want you to pay wages and these other specific expenses, and we want you to hold on to your people. So this, um, the FT calculation compares one of two time periods, either a time period in 2019 or January and February of 2020 to the number of FTEs you had during the forgiveness or for covered period or forgiveness period. There's still a penalty for it, but what they've done with the Flexibility Act uh, and some other things that they've done is I think, I think they've really made it pretty easy for a lot of people to get full forgiveness. Um, plus, we're going to talk about some math in the, uh, in the application that's kind of interesting. So they, um, if you were unable to rehire some employees because you offered them a job and they said, no, thanks, I'm making more on unemployment, you don't have to reduce your headcount 
by that FTE. Um, if you lost someone to retirement or maternity leave, you don't have to reduce your headcount. If you lost someone and you can't find a suitable replacement, you don't have to reduce your headcount. So for example, let's say I'm a business that had, I'm gonna do simple, 10 employees, and one person retired and I can't find a suitable replacement, and one person wouldn't come back when I reoffered them their job, so it looks like I have eight FTEs. On the form, on the PPP Schedule A worksheet, there is a line that says, you know, how many employees fall under the exemption or not for the rehire exemption. I would put two and then I would be back to 10 and I would have 100% as my ratio. And so long as I spent all my dollars, I would get 100% forgiveness. The other um, caveat that they added that I think is fantastic is this inability to return to the same level of business as February 2020 due to compliance with federal requirements or guidance related to COVID-19. So think about that as capacity constraints in place um, because of um, uh, because of uh, like social distancing, right? So like a business that has to be at 50% capacity, well, you're not gonna hire back 100% of your employees. Um, and this is directly or indirectly. That became clear in an FAQ that they issued um, in the July. Um, so it doesn't have to be, you know, directly. It can be indirectly. So, um, and this is like the CDC guidance. So it says, it basically says CDC and Department of Health. But what they clarify in the FAQs is basically if your state was under a stay at home or closed down order, that basically, and, and as a result of that, or any other restrictions put on you by your local government, um, basically that qualifies under this. So, you know, restaurants are such a slam dunk in my mind. Retail, um, uh, hospitality, uh, even we've got some manufacturing companies who are not able to run the same amount of shifts. Or think about if you're a supplier to one of those industries and because the stay at home order, the restaurants were shut down and now you don't have as much business as you did before. Um, so I think that gives business owners a lot of flexibility to say, look, I couldn't get my FT numbers back up because of these requirements. I'll talk a little bit about what I think you need to do for that from the application standpoint. The other thing they changed on is the PPP loan term. This is only for the new loans. So now there's a minimum maturity of five years and a maximum maturity of, my face is in the way, 10 years. Um, the, only the new loans are subject to, the, to these new terms. The old loans are still two years. Now you are allowed as an old loan holder to go back and try and renegotiate with your bank, but I can't imagine what bank is gonna be interested in extending your terms from two to five years. Um, and again, I think most people's objectives and goals at this point are to get full forgiveness. They don't have many people who are looking to, you know, turn it into a, a loan, despite how good the cost of debt is. Uh, also changed as previously, it was a six month deferral on loan payment, and now it's deferred until forgiveness is determined. Um, that can be a much longer time period. So uh, this is a good strategy as you're advising your clients. If you do have someone whose loan is going to convert, so who's not going to get full forgiveness and is going to convert some of it to a loan, and they want to defer the payment for cash flow issues, you have up to 10 months after the end of your covered period to apply for forgiveness. And then there's 60 days for the uh, SBA, or sorry, the lender to decide. And then there's uh, once the application is complete, so conceivably you could send it an incomplete application. Uh, and extend it longer. Um, and then the SBA, if you're over 2 million or pulled for a sample audit, uh, you would have another 90 days. So in theory, you could probably pretty easily stretch this out to over a year uh, if you wanted to time that. Um, so that gives you some kind of a, a pretty decent amount of runway if you've got a client who's got some cash flow issues and can't get to forgiveness because maybe they just can't reopen at this point. Um, previously, you could not take advantage of the payroll tax deferral if you, um, if you had a PPP loan. Uh, in the Flexibility Act, they clarified and that you can defer your payroll taxes. Uh, and under that, 
the 2020 deferrals are deferred until December 31st, 2021, and then another 50% is December 31st, 2022. Uh, that's part of the tax part of the CARES Act. Um, but again, if you have a client who's really struggling with cash flow issues, this is a great strategy, and now it's available to people with the PPP uh, loans. So, you know, overall themes of that Flexibility Act is that I do think it provides some much needed relief to the businesses. Um, it did better align to the reopening of the economy. I think when they were thinking eight weeks, I think when, sorry, I think when they were thinking eight weeks, um, they believed that we would be open much sooner than we were and turned around much quicker than we were. And um, that just didn't happen. Um, so uh, this extends it and gives you a chance to um, you know, be able to, the business owners to sort of stretch out the money for a longer time period. Um, the cons are, is there still was a lot of questions and confusion. Honestly, I think some of that got cleared up once we got the applications. Um, it's unfortunate. I have some clients who I think would have done things very differently during that eight week period. Um, you know, for example, in order to keep their FTE count up, they paid people to be on call. I apologize, guys. Someone is knocking at the front door. <laughs> I feel like this is a webinar that is just jinxed. So um, I'm just going to keep talking and pretend like I can't hear it, even though I know they can hear me talking. Um, so the challenges are like, you know, I have a client who's a brewery, and so they pay people to be on call um, just to keep their FTE head count up. Uh, and so, you know, really unfortunate um, that they probably would have really stretched the money out and not paid people. I've got people who paid bonuses, you know, to employees to, to try and, and get rid of it. Um, so, all right. The new applications then came out. That was kind of the next big thing that happened in mid-June. Hold on one second. I'm so sorry. This is the weirdest thing I've ever had to do. Now is when I wish I had some uh, elevator music to play in the background. Little, I know. <laughs> Ipanema or something. All right, I'm so sorry. Um, there's a friend knocking on the door who would not go away. So I was like, you have to go away. Um, all right, let's focus. So there's two new applications that came out. I, I hope all of you have experienced something equally horrific in this whole work from home environment and that you're all out there empathizing because you've had a child crying or a dog barking or like your husband has walked through naked behind you or something. So, all right. So, um, sorry, Brett and Wendy. Um, so the new forgiveness applications came out, and I think the big sort of thing about that is that we had um, two options. Um, so the full forgiveness form, which is Form 3508, came out, and then there was now an easy form. Um, you know, if you spend any time with the application, you know, it's kind of like a tax return. There's a front schedule, and then there's a sub-schedule, and then there's a sub-schedule to a sub-schedule. Uh, and uh, you know, we have filled a couple of out, a couple of them out as a sort of test situation. And, um, you know, it is sort of like filling out a tax return in a way. And when we thought the 3508 was the one that we were going to, um, have to fill out, we had a lot of clients who were really clamoring for our help with it, um, and sort of ready to hire us. I don't know what you all have experienced, but that has died down with this easy form. I think we're finding that a lot of our clients um, are uh, uh, qualifying for the easy form or close enough to quality that they're going to file the easy form uh, and don't need our help anymore. So you can file the easy form if you meet certain criteria. Otherwise, you have to file the full regular form. And I just want to take a second to stop and talk about the way the math works on the form and this interesting phenomenon um, that we call out spending your ratio. Uh, no magic to the term, we've just kind of coined it. Um, so here's our theory on the outspending the ratio. And 
Um, it's interesting because I had kind of a hot debate with an attorney about this. Um, we have a client in common and uh, they just, they were not seeing it the same way. Um, so the way the form works is it says, how much did you spend during your covered period? And then it said, and doesn't limit it, okay? So that doesn't say how much did you spend during your covered period up to your loan amount. And then it says, um, multiply that by your FTE ratio. So you're all math people on the phone, right? So if I have a million dollar loan and I spent $1.2 million, I can have an FTE ratio less than 100% and still mathematically get to 1 million. Because then the next step it says is it says, okay, pick the lesser of these numbers. What you spent times your FTE ratio, uh, the loan amount, or your payroll divided by 60%. So as long as your FTE ratios times your spend is more than your loan amount and you've hit your 60% of the payroll thing, you're gonna get full forgiveness. So that's what we call out spending your ratio. So I could have 80% FTE ratios, but as long as I spent more than my loan amount, I'm gonna get full forgiveness. So the debate between this attorney and I became is that she says that she thinks that's inconsistent with the CARES Act. I don't disagree with her. I do think it's inconsistent with the purpose of the CARES Act and what they were trying to get you to do, which is to keep all of your people. But I also think that they wrote the application and they should have been, I don't want to say smart enough, but I, it feels to me like that that was deliberate leaving off the um, language that says, you know, up to the loan amount. So just kind of interesting. Um, so that where we landed actually, I mean, on this particular client that we we're talking about, so this particular client actually has um, a loan more than $2 million. So we know it will automatically go to the SBA. We also have, this client also has a pretty low risk tolerance. Um, and so where we landed, the attorney and I was basically that she, she agreed with me that was the way the form worked. I agreed with her that it was not uh, consistent with the purpose of the CARES Act. And that this client, given their risk tolerance and being over 2 million, we needed to look for a different solution to get them to 100% forgiveness. In the end, we basically decided that they qualified for that um, uh, safe harbor, uh, the FTE safe harbor, where they can't get back to their pre-COVID levels because of social distancing and the shutdown. So just kind of interesting. So this is that same safe harbor that I was talking about. This is the actual language. So you'll see here where it says, you know, that it, due to compliance with requirements established or guidance issued between March 1st by the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Director of the CDC or Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Now it does say, and this is really important, and if you're looking for ways to help your clients, you know, one of the ways we've been really working with and trying to help our clients is on the documentation aspect of it. Um, and two ways. So one is as it relates to the safe harbor. It's not that any of us are gonna like forget ever what happened in 2020. Uh, it's more about the fact that you're gonna forget some of the nuances potentially and the SBA will have up to six years to audit you after your forgiveness. So let's say you take a, it takes you six months to get forgiveness. Um, you know, from that standpoint, uh, you could be looking at seven years, so six and a half years, you know, after you or seven years after you've gotten the loan. Um, and so we're working with our clients to document if we, th if we think that they, fall into this FTE reduction, we're working with them on documenting that, right? Putting together a memo for the file. We're doing the same thing on the good faith certification. I know that they say that they're like anybody under 2 million, they're assuming that they have the good faith. Um, to say that I don't trust sort of the changing rules of the game might be an understatement. And so we're also advising clients that like, even if you're under 2 million, put together your good faith certification memo. What, where were you at in April and May? What was happening with your company? What was your access to capital? Um, you know, even if you're under 2 million, if you're over 2 million, absolutely you need to be putting together a memo. Um, but a lot of companies, I mean, I don't know where your clients are falling out, but a lot of companies are actually, um, are actually having better years than they anticipated. I think a lot of people are very nervous about 2021. And so, you know, 
I think I have a lot of clients who are like, well, what if I have a better 2020 than they had in 2019? And so it's so important to be documenting, you know, all of that information about where you were at in April and May uh, and why things were not looking good. And if you felt that this was, uh, you know, necessary due to the economic uncertainty, we're doing the same thing with this that FTE safe harbor, helping them sort of connect the dots between the regulations, the shutdown, the social distancing, and how it's impacting their company and why they qualify for the FTE safe harbor. So real opportunity here to help your clients in a meaningful way. So uh, you remember I said that they just sort of in the CARES Act did like an edit, find, replace, and anything that was June became December. Well, um, now, uh, now, uh, now what they've said is it's the earlier of, how's it go? It's the early of the date that you submit your forgiveness application in December 31st. So there's a couple of provisions that say, hey, if you can't get your FTEs up, as long as you have them back, as long as you had your FTEs back to your pre-COVID levels, basically by June 30th, you're fine. Well, when they made that June 30th and replaced it with December 31st, we had a lot of clients who said, well, I was planning on using that safe harbor do I now have to wait until December 31st? So now it's either December 31st or the submission of your application date. Strategically, as you're advising clients, I think this is really important. So I'm going to use an accounting firm, for example. So let's just say you're an accounting firm. We bring uh, new classes or a law firm. Um, although I don't know when law firms bring on their new classes. I'm going to stick with my accounting firm example. So we bring new classes on in the fall, right? We all bring on our new hires in September. Um, some, some firms are delaying a little bit this year. Um, <clears throat> but let's say you need that new class to hit your FTE ratio. Well, just wait and file your application after those folks are hired. So let's say you're done with your money, but you're four people short and you have a, a class of five FTEs coming in in September. Well, on September 30th, file your application, invoke the safe harbor, and show that on September 30th, when you filed your application, you had you were you know one over your FT limit. So it really gives the borrower the opportunity to um, it really gives the opportunity to the borrower to time this in a way that's most beneficial for them. So all right. All right, so here are the three ways that you can file or your clients can file the easy form. The first is that they're a self-employed individual independent contractor who had no employees. Um, so that's gonna be incredibly helpful. Uh, and all the easy form is it's, it's technically three pages. The first page you put your dollar amounts in and you add them up. The easy form assumes that you have a 100% FTE ratio. So you're not going to see the math on the easy form that says like multiply by your FTE ratio. It just assumes that you hit 100% and you'll see why in these options. Second page is your certifications that you did everything you were supposed to do. And the third page is um, some demographic information. So it is really quite straightforward. So self-employed, no contractors, you could do the easy, or no employees, excuse me. You could do the easy form. The second one is basically if you're certifying that you did not reduce wages um, or salaries by 25% and you did not reduce your FTEs. So if you have a company who didn't reduce wages or pay or didn't have a reduction in headcount, they get to file the easy form. But here's the thing. I still think that they need to do those calculations and keep them in their files to show that they've met that test. Um, because I don't think you wanna be, again, six years from now trying to recreate those calculations for payroll reports you may or may not have or FTE information you may or may not have. So for our clients that wanna do this, we're saying, that's great, show us your calculation, You know, like let us look at your calculation and let's make sure that you really can file this and then keep it in your PPP file. And then the third one, the other reason you can file the easy form is because you meet that safe harbor that we've been talking about. You didn't reduce anybody by 25% and you were unable to return to the same level during the covered period um, because of compliance with COVID-19 requirements. So 
Um, I think we're, what we're finding is a lot of people are falling under number two. Like a lot of our construction companies have been going strong because of their backlog. So they're falling under number two. Uh, a lot of our ones in hospitality and some of the service industries and restaurants and those that are adjacent are falling under number three. And of course we have some that are number ones as well. All right, so this is the most frequently asked question I get from my clients right now. When can I apply? When can I apply? When can I apply? Um, most of the banks are not ready to accept applications. The primary reason for that is that the SBA is supposed to tell them on Monday the 10th how, and how the portal is set up for them to submit applications. I have heard some rumors that that date might get pushed back. Um, part of that is because of this pending legislation that we're gonna talk about in a second. Um, a lot of the banks are building like these online portals. So if you're helping a client, um, the banks that I've talked to, um, they all say basically that you, that you can give your ID to your accountant, they can make an ID for your accountant. So if you're helping someone through it uh, and they do have the online portal, you'll be able to go in and enter everything. Then your client generally will be able to go back and look at it and improve it and submit it. Um, one of the things I think is also very important if you're consulting with clients is not only making sure that they have filled out the numbers appropriately, but they have all of the supporting documentation organized in a way that makes it very easy for the bank to review it. Because here's one of the really critical things. Um, the bank has 60 days to approve or deny it once they have a complete application. So if you have a client whose hair is on fire to get, um, to get approval because they want it done this year, then it really behooves them to make sure that they take their time and submit a complete application with you know, basically good work papers, right? So I've had a lot of clients email me in the last couple of days. Somebody wanted to go around their bank and apply directly to the SBA. I don't even know if that's a, a, an option, um, but I, try, I just tried to slow them down a little bit and explain this to them, right? Like we, we want to take a minute, make sure it's done appropriately and that you have the good supporting work papers because you, what you don't want to do is we all remember how crazy it was to get the applications. What you don't want to do is like get in line, think you have a complete application, find out you don't, have to go back and basically resubmit and be at the back of the line. Um, because the bank's clock doesn't start ticking until they have the complete application. So they're going to do the ones first who are a complete application. They're going to do first in, first out. Now, once the bank's approved it, and their, their decision like is approved, deny, or I think they have a code where they can ask for further review from the SBA. So if they thought there was something questionable or they weren't sure how to handle, they can call the SBA in for some help. Um, if it's over $2 million, it automatically goes to the SBA, who has uh, 90 days once they have all their information. So if they want follow-up information, it could be longer. So as I said, as the SBA is want to do. They dropped 23 new S FAQs on us. And I love how they draft them like at six o'clock at night. It makes me so happy that when I'm about to log off and thinking that I got everything wrapped up for the day, they drop some FAQs on me. Or I don't know, I feel like that's when I find out about them. Um, a lot of what was in those F 23 FAQs actually related back to the application and a lot of things that I just told you. But there was some additional clarification that I think was really helpful. Um, so we'll kind of walk through each of those real quick. So the first thing was about group health care and retirement. Uh, what I've done on each of these slides, uh, the first bullet is like my little takeaway and then this, the bullets beneath it are like actual question and like excerpts from the question and answer. I think the important thing to take away here is acceleration of group health care and retirement is not allowed. Now, interestingly enough, it is silent about what if you're paying 2019's 401k contribution during the covered period? Um, so, you know, for a lot of companies, that's kind of a, their match is a big number. Um, and that counts as payroll. So it counts towards your 60%. So it's just kind of interesting that they're silent about that. But basically, you can't say, well, I'm going to fund my 401k or my profit sharing plan like through the whole year and try and take all that. If frankly, some of these shenanigans and games that some people wanted to play before are just not necessary when you can now get up to 24 weeks worth of payroll. But, you know, to the extent you have a client still doing that. Um, they also clarified that interest on unsecured credit is not a forgivable payment. 
this is where this gets confusing, I think, to a lot of people is um, interest and unsecured credit is a permissible expense, meaning you can spend the money on it, but it's not eligible for forgiveness. And I, and they have not up until this point been so explicit about it. This is the first time they got real explicit about it. Um, so you can spend it on it, but that part's going to be a loan. Uh, they also clarified that if you remember payments on any leases, as long as the lease was entered into before February 15th of 2020 were permitted. This actually happened to a client of mine. He's like, my lease is like April, but it's a renewal of an old lease. And, you know, I had said to him, well, I think if you could show, you know, the original lease and the new lease and that there weren't substantial changes in the terms that you should be okay. Thankfully, they have come out and agreed that as long as you can prove that the renewal relates to a renewal of a pre-February 15th of 2020 lease, you're okay. So good news there. Transportation. So this has just been one of the craziest parts of this. So for so, and I just don't understand like how hard would it have been to answer this question? So for so long, uh, everybody has speculated like what is transportation cost, you know? Is it fuel? Is it gasoline? Is it mileage? So uh, it turns out it is a service for distribution of transportation that refers to transportation utility fees assessed by state and local governments. Payment of these fees by the borrower is eligible for loan forgiveness. And then they have this link and it takes you to this link that basically says it's found in some small cities and just a few states. Um, and it's like used for, it's like it's some kind of financing that's used, that's considered a utility. So for the majority of everybody, this just does not apply. Now, what's kind of important about it is we actually have a few clients who have been counting on it being fuel or gasoline or mileage. Uh, and so now we've kind of had to go back to them and say, it's not fuel, it's not gasoline, it's not mileage. You need to take that out and you're gonna need to probably run another week or two of payroll to be able to get to your maximum expenses. So transportation question, finally answered, the speculation is over. Um, the FTE reductions. So it's interesting, if you looked at the return, spent a lot of time with it, there is a PPP Schedule A worksheet that is where you do your FTE calculations. And they break the boxes into those who make less than 100,000 and those who make more than 100,000. And it's only up in the those who make less than 100,000 where they have the line item that says how many FTEs could you, you know, meet the FTE reduction and that's the like I can't hire you back and all of that stuff. So it almost looks like if the if you're it's it's just kind of hard to interpret like so what do I do if I have a $100,000 person that I couldn't hire back? There's no line in my 100,000 person people that make a $100,000 schedule for that same thing. What they clarified is that even if the employee makes more than 100,000, if they fall in one of those categories, then um, the, uh, if they fall in one of those categories of retirement, maternity leave, fired, didn't want to come back, fired, can't find a suitable replacement, you, you put that number up in the under $100,000 table on the PPP Schedule A worksheet. So, that's what this, uh, this question was. It was actually helpful for a couple of my clients who were not sure. Owner's compensation. So for owner's compensation, this was kind of a, this was a little kind of an eye opener. Um, so the FAQs covered all of these different uh, FAQs on owner's compensation. Um, most of the time the owner's comp is the, diff is the lower of a pro rata amount of the 2019 um, income or two and a half months, which is 20,833, sorry, two and a half months capped at 100,000. Um, what this Q&A told us is it's really kind of at the bottom. Basically that cap applies across all your entities. So if you have an owner who's making, let's say you have an owner who has three entities and they're making $75,000 from each of the entities, uh, you have to aggregate those and limit it to 100,000 and then limit it to 20,833 during the covered period. Um, I'm not going to say that some of my people were trying to play games and do that, but, you know, I'm sure there were companies out there that were doing that. I, a big person, I'm a big, I was a big proponent all along of this. And I think this is another thing to think about when you're advising your clients. 
these are public dollars, right? So playing games with public dollars that are subject to public dollar information requests is just not a good idea. Um, so um, anyways, so now they've sort of put a kibosh to owners paying themselves from you know four different businesses. This is also part of the Q&A, and I think sort of just a helpful recap. Uh, it tells you, uh, based on the entity type, whether you can include healthcare and how much of retirement you can include. You can see at the Schedule C level, no healthcare, no requirement. General partners, no healthcare, no requirement. Um, you know, C Corp, yes, you can include healthcare. S Corp, no, for owners at least two percent stake in the business. So. Uh, there, this section, if this is something that's coming up with you for your clients, this is probably about a page and a half of Q&A. I would suggest going and reading it very carefully if this is something you need to navigate. Um, this is sort of my high level recap for you. All right, so just real quick about the pending legislation. Um, I hear that there's some difficulty getting it through because there's um, things that have been added to it and it sort of tag alongs as, as, as does happen and so, I'm not, I'm just not, I'm not quite sure. I'll, you know what's going to happen, guys. I'm going to say I'm not quite sure when or if this is going to get passed and we'll like all get off of here and we'll get passed five minutes later. I, I honestly feel like that's happened to me before in this. So if it gets passed, those that are 150 or less would just automatically get forgiveness. They'd have to submit a one page attestation form. I suspect it would look like page two of the easy form saying, I did what I was supposed to and I didn't do anything inappropriate. It covers 80, like it covers I think 85% of the borrowers, but only 26% of the funds. So it would be so much easier for a lot of those folks. Um, there is additional discussion, but I don't think it's informal legislation about those between 150, sorry, there should be an extra zero there, and 2 million um, sort of being able to do the same thing. I don't think that has any pending legislation, but there's certainly been chatter about it. The other thing that's hanging out there is this uh, next wave, the Prioritization Paycheck Protection Program, P4 Act. Um, this, there's about a hundred billion, is that right? A hundred million? There's a lot of money out there still. Uh, I just can't remember if it's a B, yeah, it's a hundred billion dollars left still, sorry. Um, and this would be sort of like another, you would have the opportunity to come back and get another wave of PPP money if you met certain criteria. So less than 100 businesses and then a 50% reduction in revenue to COVID-19 and that you need the need, that's something that's in there, need the money for payroll and eligible non-payroll costs. Um, they would set aside some money for employers with fewer than 10 in the underserved and rural communities. Um, I think that if this gets passed, uh, we're all going to be in the same boat with a bunch of questions, like right? what is a 50% reduction in revenues? What's our comparison period that we're supposed to be looking at? Um, so there could be some consulting work if this gets passed for us to be helping clients navigate that. And in my last five minutes, I just want to talk to you briefly about the Main Street Lending Program in case it's just a program that you haven't looked at a lot. The reason for that is I actually think there's a role for forensic accountants uh, to help with this. So um, they had some recent changes to the program. I'm actually going to go forward a slide and back a slide. So there's three like sort of tranches. There's new loans, priority loans, and expanded loans. Um, some of the new changes that are in particular to that minimum loan size. So uh, originally like the minimum loan size I think was like a million dollars. Um, dropping it to 250 is gonna make this far more accessible. I actually have some clients who now are gonna be able to, to apply for Main Street Lending. Figuring out the loan, and here's the challenge. So this is a facility that they expect to get paid 85% back on. So they're really only trying to lend it to companies that are going to have the ability to repay. And the way they're doing that is they're determining the loan size by taking the 2019 EBITDA and multiplying it by some multiple, four or six, depending on the type of loans. And then subtracting from that any existing debt, and that includes any undrawn but committed debt. So like if you had a line of credit that you hadn't drawn on, I think you have to subtract that too. So for some of our clients, this is kind of hard. The ones that really want it are 
not in as healthy of condition to be able to get it. Um, so you first have to do the math to see if it works for them. And then if it does, um, the borrowers have to demonstrate that covered losses, like the reason they're down, are sustained from COVID disruption and the operations are at risk. Good faith efforts were taken to maintain payroll, financial statements, employee levels, payroll records, and financial needs for the remainder of 2020, operating plans, and anticipated use of proceeds. I don't know about you guys, but that sounds sort of like a damage calculation, some projections, and a sources and uses analysis. So I do think that there is a really big opportunity here to be able to, um, I think there's a really big opportunity here to help our clients through this. So uh, I would start, pay attention to and take a look at the Main Street Lending Program because I think that, that uh, I think that there's some opportunities and I think the changes they made open that up to more people. So, all right. So I've got a question chatted in and I actually got through that despite the person pounding on my door. Uh, with three minutes to spare. So if anybody has any other questions, um, feel free to chat them in right now and I'll answer this one while we've got a few minutes. So the question is, if I use owner's comp as an allowable expense towards forgiveness, since owner's comp is not an expense for my LLC, does that mean I wouldn't have to worry about it being a non-deductible expense? So the way it works, all right, there's our last attendance check. Um, the way it works, I, I think you're saying, I think you're asking, I, I'm going to make an assumption and uh, that maybe you're a single member LLC. Um, so if you're a single member LLC, the way they measure owner's comp is they look at 2019 profits. Um, and so you're, and this is the part they still haven't answered. Like, I don't, I don't know if you're supposed to cut yourself a check, right? So like if your profits were in 2019, $100,000, then you're limited to 20833 And what we've been telling clients is that they should write themselves a check, even though it's not a deductible expense for taxes, as like their compensation up to the 2833 It is a little silly, um, and but... It, then at least you have proof of it because that's the problem, right? Um, so it's limited to, I'm sorry, it's limited to 100,000 or your 2019 income. I just, it's the lesser of. Um, so if you're over 100,000, you're capped at 100,000. So mechanically, we've been telling our clients, write yourself a check for it. Um, you know, that's your proof that you paid yourself for your compensation. Um, second question is, is there consensus on whether the idle grant needs to be paid back? Um, so yeah, I think so. So if you got a PPP loan, you're going to see on the forgiveness form that there is a, you know, did you get an idle grant? If so, how much? What the instructions say is while that doesn't, there's no place where it actually subtracts it on the face of the form. When forgiveness happens, your forgivable amount will be reduced by that. So hypothetically, if I have a $100,000 loan, PPP loan, and I got a $10,000 idle, I'll put those numbers on my form. I'll apply for $100,000 of forgiveness. They'll give me $90,000 of forgiveness and make me pay back the $10,000. Um, so the idle grant is not required to be paid back, though, if you did not get a PPP loan. So strategically, I'm working with a very small client right now. When we did the math, um, she's kind of a startup, so her 2019 income only was going to give her like a fifty set, like a five thousand um, dollar. I think it was like a five thousand dollar PPP loan, but we think her numbers may because she had really stiff, significant growth. We think maybe her numbers are going to support then more of a, a higher idle um, grant. So she is going for the idle grant and not the PPP loan, so she can get more money. As long as she doesn't have a PPP loan, she does not have to pay the IELTS grant back. So, all right. Well, that is the end of our time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all so much for putting up with the craziness of me knocking my laptop over and the person pounding at my door that would just not go away. Uh, and really appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your stuff. And I'm happy to help anybody with anything. Always here as a resource for you. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca.